Good morning. Hey, it's another car scope day. Mm. Hey, Roseanne. Oh, we got other people in here and I didn't see their names. Hey, Tanya. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, another car scope day. Good morning. Good morning, replay viewers and web viewers and live viewers. And I'd love to take this seat belt off, but the Outback starts yelling at you to put your seat belt on. We are back at the plant because he got hired yesterday. Woohoo! So we had to come back over today to do his orientation paperwork. Yeah. Yeah, they called him uh, about an hour after we left. So I was like, you couldn't have decided that while we were already here. You know what's cool about this whole um, situation of his is he didn't qualify for Georgia unemployment because we hadn't been here long enough. I know, right? He could have saved us a trip. So uh, we haven't been getting unemployment this whole time. And then we found out that we could file in Colorado, which we did, and it was approved, but he can't claim it till next week. Uh, eventually, yeah. Much faster bumping up to daytime at this plant. It's a pay cut, but the situation is a lot better. Newer equipment. Um, they don't deny you breaks. There's not a lot of safety hazards. Um, so it's two bucks an hour less, but you can't. That's the thing. It's like, it's so interesting because in his interview, they kept saying, yes, more ease. They kept saying, um, uh, why would you want to take $2 an hour less? Now, they know that the other company has a bad reputation, but they were asking him that. And yeah, and he was like, well, this safety hazard, that safety hazard, um, there's people that have been there three years and still aren't on the day shift. He's like, you know, um. It's okay, $2 an hour less. Yeah, that's a bummer, but, you know, you got to look at quality. It's for uh, at the carpet mill. Right, and being stuck on the night shift for years. They told him here it would be less than a year. Everybody starts on nights, and they told him it would be less than a year for him to switch over to days. They're expanding. Their company's growing. Look at... I love my moose. Uh, and um, so, but even even when he got hired yesterday, I wasn't like, oh, what a relief, sigh of relief, because I wasn't holding my breath this whole time. It's a new experience for me. Um, I didn't worry. I didn't get upset. I used this as an opportunity to do things differently. And when he got hired, we were like, cool, when do you start? Monday. Oh, Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Dalton Carpet Land. Carpet Mill Land. It's carpet Capital. I don't know. <laughs> it calls itself the Carpet Capital. I don't know if it actually is. I think it is. So when you're not holding your breath, you don't have that sigh of relief when something changes because you're okay with it as it is already. Of course, it wasn't our preference that he be unemployed for five weeks. But we weren't struggling and fighting about the situation either. We weren't stressing. I, I'll say I, wasn't stressing myself out about it. Um, because I, I, I just wasn't worried about it anymore. That's a big difference. And it was really a cool feeling to just go, oh, okay, well, all right. We'll head over again in the morning. We weren't sure what the roads were going to be like, and Heath struggles with new places, so I'll drive with him a couple of times. And yeah, faith regardless. Like, faith that we were going to be okay regardless. Whether he got another job, whether he stayed on unemployment, whether we lost everything and had to move into a shelter. <laughs> faith regardless. We're not going to die from being unemployed in our country. Now, if we were somewhere else... But even faith for that, like even faith in that situation, it can't be the worst possible thing. Yeah, it's just the next step on the path. So, that's what happens when you pick apart your stories. 
things change. So today's, um, hey Nina, Heath got the job, Nina. You guys, I really appreciate all the um, hearts and support and encouragement that we've gotten over the last few weeks of this job situation. And talking to you about this stuff every day. Love is content, not form. Yeah. Content, not form. We weren't worried about the form. We. I say we, but I mean I. Uh, I can't find my card, but my name is Michelle Wolf, and you can find me at caddyshackdesigns.com. And across the top of that website are tabs for everything that you ever needed to know. Maybe more. <laughs> Lesson 22 today's Course in Miracles for January 22nd. What I see is a form, form, thank you. What I see is a form of vengeance. There's the website. Oh, <laughs> that's okay. CaddyCheckDesigns.com. That's where you can find me <laughs> for coaching and desire map workshops. Speaking of, Desire Map Workshops, there's two that are coming up pretty quickly. The one for men starts February 17th and is at dm4men.eventbrite.com. Yeah, they got it. And the Level 2 Desire Map Workshop is coming up starting February 18th. So they're coming up pretty quick. And it is Desire Map Level 2, number 2, eventbrite.com. Or you can just message me if you need more information. So interesting today. Let's see what this means. What I see is a form of vengeance. What? Lesson 22. What I see is a form of vengeance. Oh, hey, Emily. I didn't, I didn't see you. Come in. Good morning. What I see is a form of vengeance. How can that be possible? Let's, let's read. Today's idea accurately describes the way anyone who holds attack thoughts in his mind must see the world. That's what they mean by vengeance. If we're holding attack thoughts, and all fearful thoughts are attack thoughts. I'm either attacking me or you or the world in general. Having projected anger onto the world, we see vengeance about to strike. So we're always running around waiting for that next blow and we're always running away around um prepared to defend our ego to the death no matter how ridiculous we are ready to fight tooth and nail just whatever you do don't deconstruct my story okay i want you to keep me i want you to collude with me so i can keep my story intact so when I call you and tell you how awful things are, you're supposed to say, I know. And then you're supposed to tell me your awful story so we can feel awful together. Yeah, I'm glad. I, I wouldn't want anybody to do that. Because when you stop joining people in their story, they might get mad at you. And I have had people get mad at me. But then you give them an opportunity to go... It's, yeah, it's not helpful at all. It's not helpful at all. Then we're both suffering. Um, so if you can find a way, yes, office gossip, which is so tempting to engage in for the ego self. And when you disengage from it, people can get mad. Yeah, office gossip is a terrible temptation. His own attack is thus perceived as self-defense. Okay, we run around attacking others, but we say we're just defending ourselves. But that's not really true. We're, we're attacking. This becomes an increasingly vicious circle until he is willing to change how he sees. Until we're willing to see things differently, we're going to run around defending our story. It's what we do. We haven't really given ourselves any other option. Thoughts of attack and counterattack will preoccupy him and people his entire world. What peace of mind is possible when you're running that story? If I'm always thinking about you and what you're doing to me and preparing my defense against it or what the world is doing or what the economy is doing or what thing came flying out of Donald Trump's mouth or... What kind of gobbledygook came belting out of Sarah Palin? 
I don't know what you waste any time thinking about that because it just, there's no point in it. I don't need to prepare to defend myself against the ridiculousness in the world because it's just me. If I'm looking at it and getting upset, that's just a, a cue for me to look at my story about politics. It really is just a waste of time. I have to tell you that um, God bless Sarah Palin. Bless her heart. She, uh, I really do feel compassion for her. I really do. She's just, she just tries so damn hard. She really does. She has so much passion for her convictions. And the stuff that comes out of her mouth are just like, what? Where'd that come from, honey? What, what are you talking about, honey? You, you ain't making no sense. <laughs> so I actually have, I used to just be really, really repelled by her, but I do have compassion for her now. Donald Trump, not so much. I'm still working on that one. Okay, it is from this savage fantasy. Listen to that word. This is strong. It is from this savage fantasy that you want to escape. If only we could channel that passion into other directions. That's what we're doing. You're doing it. I'm doing it. Doing it and doing it and doing it. Well, that's what we're doing here. We're we're doing it. He is hard. He <laughs> He is the hard to love kid in the room. Oh, Sarah Palin's. I know. Let's us channel her stuff into better directions. <laughs> Let's see if we can find a way to shift her in the stream. You're funny. Okay, savage. It is savage. When we're attacking, we are living a savage fantasy. We're savaging ourselves. We're hurting ourselves. When we've, <laughs> when we've experienced um, a negative event and we replay it in our head over and over again, now who's victimizing who? If something bad happens... And we go over it and over it and over it. There's a point, you have to go over it to a certain extent to recover and heal and find your new normal. Um, but some people will grind on a situation for years, for lifetimes. Um, that's abusive. That's savage. That is a savage fantasy that I hold hope. Hey, Linda, I hold hope that we'll all escape. Is it not joyous news to hear that it's not real? Isn't it great to know that it's false? It's an illusion from which you can wake up? Is it not a happy discovery to find that you can escape? You can escape this cycle. You are escaping this cycle by doing this daily work. All that you fear does not, it's a huge relief. That is a sigh of relief. When you find out that by doing daily work like this, you can break free and long-held patterns of anxiety and distress can seemingly disappear. Yeah, it's having less and less a grip. Just like when he got the job yesterday and I was like, gosh, normally I'd be like so relieved and I'd be exhaling. And it's like, well, I wasn't holding my breath. I realized that I had not been holding my breath. We hold our breath all the time. Oh, that reminds me. That book, Sedona Method, uh, you can Google it, Sedona Method. It's the one where you, the first exercise he has you do is hold a pen, think about all your anxiety and thoughts. Yeah. And then drop it to just demonstrate how easy it is to drop thoughts. One of the exercises is in there where Okay, so say if I had been freaking out about his job, so I'd be stuck in fear, and he would ask, like, what's that fear about? Is it fear of, is it need for security? Is it need for approval? Whatever. It would have been need for security. So then he'll have you say that about whatever you're anxious about, and then t ask yourself, can you let go of wanting this to happen? So when we're worried about, well, I might lose my job, or the economy might collapse, or Trump might be elected, can we let go of wanting that to happen 
And that sounds like weird in the beginning, but if you think about it, if you're running around anxious, you're seeking relief from anxiety. So it's like kids who expect something bad to happen, so they push and push and push and push until something bad happens, so that then they can go, okay, it's over. So abused kids do this a lot. If you take a kid out of an abusive home, they act like maniacs in foster care because they're in that abuse cycle. So you see it a lot where you can't handle the anxiety of anticipating something bad happening. So you push and push and push until it happens so that you can get relief from the anxiety. So on the surface, you're like, why would a kid, act, you know, push people until they hit him? Because he can't stand the anxiety of expecting a hit that hasn't come yet. We do the same things to ourselves when we stress and stress and worry about our bank account. Like, what if, what if I fall below $100? Uh, what if I fall below $10? What if the... What if I, what if he gets laid off again? Like all this stuff. Well, can I let go of wanting that to happen? Will sometimes, oh, it's so sad. It's so sad when kids do that. Yes. So that is a self-sabotage driving behavior. Anxiety drives self-sabotage because we're anticipating the worst. And we'd really like secretly for it to just go ahead and happen so we can stop worrying about it just so we can stop thinking about it. Okay, it's happened. I don't have to worry about when it's going to happen anymore because it just happened. So we can drive ourselves to failure because we aren't understanding that we don't have to be anxious about things like that anymore. We don't have to. So he'll say, can you let go of wanting the bad thing to happen? Because it's paradoxical where that's where self-sabotage lies. Oh, we've all done it. We may all be doing it. We can't handle the anxiety. People will uh, break up with jobs and break up with relationships because they, they're they just convinced it's going to happen anyway, and so they just drive it. So if you think people are always leaving you, you'll subconsciously do stuff when things get really good to make them leave you because you can't handle the anxiety. So think about that as a concept. It took me a little while to understand that. Like, why? what? But then when I thought about it in terms of what I'd seen in children, it made sense. Like, cheat. Here comes the rain. Hopefully it won't um, be too loud for you. Yes. If you run around uh, worried all the time that you're going to do something bad, you may do that something bad just to stop feeling the anxiety of it. Okay, so you made what you would destroy. Nah, I'm just sitting in the car. I'll keep going unless the signal drops. Let me know if I need to talk louder. I know I'm really close to the camera, so I'm probably already talking too loud. Let it go, let it go. Look at the world around you at least five times today. For at least one minute each time. Oh, I'm good, all right. <laughs> As your eyes move slowly from one object to another, from one body to another, say to yourself, I see only the perishable. I see nothing that will last. What I see is not real. What I see is a form of vengeance. Now, this may take some time with that word vengeance. That's okay. At the end of each minute, ask yourself, is this the world I really want to see? Is this the world I really want to spend time in? Let's see if I can screenshot. You guys can screenshot the directions. Is this the world I really want to see? Of course not. Of course that's not the world you want to see or you wouldn't be hanging out here every morning. Tomorrow's lesson is the follow-up. I can escape from the world I see by giving up attack thoughts. I see only the perishable. When you change your thoughts, you're changing the cause. 
which means the effect will change automatically. This is the do without doing that fits in our Tao Te Ching study. When you change in here, you don't need to worry about going out and changing out there. It will take care of itself because everything comes from what arises in here. So you didn't need to worry about the end result. You worry about the cause. You change the cause and the end result changes. It, I promise it works. You got to do it every day though. That's the disappointing part. Or it was for me. I was like, Pff, day? Sheesh. Vision already holds a replacement for everything you think you see now. Loveliness can light your images and so transform them that you will love them even though they were made of hate. So even things that were made of hate, you can love. You are not trapped in the world you see because its cause, you, is changeable. The change requires first that the cause be identified. Look at your life, Susan. Look at your life and look at the people around you and it will give you all the information that you need. And look inside yourself for compulsion. If you find compulsion to act, pressure to act, you'll, you'll see that you're self-sabotaging. If you feel a compulsion Compulsion to act, don't. Sit on your hands if you have to. Go get in your bed and hide under the cover until you sort it out. Don't act on a compulsion. It's always the wrong thing. We want we know a fight is coming, so we'll compulsively poke until we start it so that we can be over it. The compulsion to act is anxiety driven. The compulsion to act is a force of destruction oh gosh Tanya yeah it's a lifetime what yeah so Roseanne shifted one self-sabotaging act at a time and ask yourself am I willing to let go of wanting to destroy this am I willing to let go of wanting to destroy the love in front of me? Am I willing to let go of wanting to destroy this job that I actually enjoy and feel like I'm not good enough for? Right. Accepting a job just because of the pay is an act of self-destruction. They were so baffled by Heath saying, I don't care that it's $2 an hour less. I don't care. It's actually almost $3 an hour less. But we don't live that way. Yeah, I found out the hard way that taking a job for a dollar amount is not worth it. It's not worth it. What if you work that job for a year of misery and then you die? You wasted a year of your life that you could have been happier just with a little less money. Compulsion, pressure, listening, got it. Good job. <laughs> Good job, Susan. So, you're the cause, which means you have the power. You have the power to change it. The law of divine compensation. Ooh, good question. Susan, what's one thing that you want to let go of? One sabotage behavior? I need some coffee. Hold on. Yuck. My coffee got cold. <laughs> okay. So remember we were talking about Dan who got offered a dream job and talked himself out of it? That's because he thought it was he was so anxious. He couldn't accept that awesome thing. Okay. So Susan, you're in the state of trying to identify. Totally. He could move up or my pay could increase. Uh, he could, they could get so much more business that they decide to do a, a merit increase for everybody. You just don't know. You've got to go with your heart. And that's happened to me before where I've taken a low pay job and 
Um, it ended up actually paying more than I expected in just a short period of time. So here's what happened. The SART team job that I took before was a grant funded job at half the pay that I had been making, but I was dying. So I had to change. Well, it was 20 hours a week at $20 an hour. Yeah, they have a chance to open their own hearts. Um, but because I was a go-getter and got in there and started doing all this stuff, they increased my hours. They didn't increase my pay, but I was able to work 30 hours a week, which in effect was a raise. And it wasn't, it was, I worked from home most of the time, so it benefited me greatly. But had I stopped myself at the thought of 20 hours a week at $20 an hour and, oh my God, I can't do it, I can't figure it out, I, I would have missed that whole four years of getting to do some really good personal growth and um, really stepping further out of those kinds of help. I was. I totally was. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what happened. They were like, um, let's just bump you up. But what was really nice is on the weeks that I, it was a flat rate. So on the weeks that I didn't have 30 hours worth of work, I still drew the same pay because there were other weeks where I'd have 30 or 35 or 40. It was, it was a very good job to have for flexibility because I had great people who were willing to work with me as I stepped further and further out of government work and that kind of helping. Politics is a dirty, dirty place to be. It's a dirty place to work. It's a hard world to move in if you have an ethical bone in your body. Um, so I learned a lot. And I learned how to let go more and more of needing to help people in that way. And needing to have a particular predictable kind of paycheck. So Dan sabotaged himself. Right, He saw something that was pushed up against his happiness threshold. And rather than challenging himself to move beyond that or just taking a chance, he really didn't have anything to lose by just taking a chance on it. Um, he just never even let himself go there. That's a situation where he could have said, can you let go of wanting this wonderful thing in front of you to fail? Can you let go of the idea that you don't deserve this? Can you stretch into the discomfort of feeling more happiness and just sit with it for a few minutes? That's how you do that. Something wonderful is happening and you're starting to freak out. You just let yourself feel the wonderfulness and hold it as long as you can. Like dipping your toe, you know, like getting into a cold swimming pool. A little bit at a time. Just stretch and hold a little bit more happiness. And when it gets to be too uncomfortable, you can just pull it back a little. And then you'll be pulling back less and stretching more and pulling back less and stretching more. It's a process. Okay, being open to miracles is a discipline. It's constantly asking yourself, how can I see this differently? Please, God, change my perception of what's happening so I can see the full story. The very nature of miracles is that they represent the interruption of a pattern, a discontinuation of the status quo. When you start doing this work, your life can get dumped upside down and things can look extremely wrong and chaotic. But you're turning, you're, you're changing your patterns, you're disconnecting from your previous way of moving in the life and that can look pretty ugly about Yay and yes, please. Around the third or fourth week of desire mapping in a five-week section, around the third or fourth week, things can turn ugly um, because your story is being torn apart. And it's a miracle. It's a miracle you've asked for. But on the surface, it can look really chaotic. It can look really chaotic. There can be lots of emotions. There can be weird things going on. And you just stick it out. And this can be months. But then you, it all starts to settle down in new places. And you come out on the other side in a completely different frame of mind. A completely different frame of mind. But you have to keep following your heart to make it through that process. 
and don't give up. You've got to follow your heart. Sometimes the chaos means there are situations that need to change. And you'll know if you stay connected to source. You'll know if you stay anchored with your core desired feeling or your perception of God, whatever that is. You'll know what to do next as long as you stay centered, like the Course in Miracles reading today. As long as you stay centered in knowing that you're the cause you won't worry so much about what the effect. Okay? Does that make sense? You gotta anchor in connection to be able to find your way through when everything's exploding all around you. It's exploding for a good reason, but that can get forgotten and people will pull back and stop the work when don't do that. Don't give up. Whatever that means, don't give up. God does not know of limits nor bow before the ego's dictates of scarcity and lack. We read this the last time, I think. He doesn't share the ego's shabby assessment of you and neither should you. We think we have many different problems, but we really have only one. Our separation from source. Our perception of being alone. Our perception of having to figure, I got to figure this out. I got to figure this out. And I'm all alone. You're not all alone and you don't have to figure it all out. Several years ago, a man came up to me and said, all this lean on God stuff isn't me. I told him that in my own life, whenever I haven't leaned on God, I found myself leaning on something or someone I'd been better off not leaning on in the first place. It is not a weakness to lean on the power of the universe that resides within us. It's a myth that we can be the lone hero not depending on anyone or anything else. That's a garbage story. The soul leans. That is part of its nature. Idolatry is when we lean on something or someone. Yeah, I gotta figure it out. You gotta figure it out. Gotta make it happen. That's old. Idolatry is when we lean on something or someone that is not in fact the source of our ultimate good thinking for some insane reason that it is. I'm glad you're seeing it. So when the Bible talks about false idols, worshiping false idols, for a long time I didn't understand that. It was like, well, so what? You're, you know, you're not really f worshiping a false idol. But what it was saying is, are false idols make us forget where the true source of power is. So if I'm worshiping at the altar of Facebook, I forget that Facebook is not my source. If I'm worshiping at the idol of the dollar and working and working and working and focusing and focusing and focusing on a number, I forget that that number is not my source. My husband is not my source. Periscope is not my source. God is. Source is. Love is. Whatever you want to call it. Divine Beloved is one of my favorite things to call it. That's my source. So whenever something's going wrong, I don't have to grasp onto it or grab it and hold it and nail it to the ground and try and hang on to it because it's not where my good comes from. If it's leaving, let it leave. Pack it a lunch and send it on its way. If it's coming in, let it come in. Don't grasp and grip. And understanding where your source is is the only way to not grasp and grip. So when people were worshiping statues, they were forgetting that the source of power was not in the statue. This is how people fight themselves to the death over a burning flag. The flag is a symbol. The statue is a symbol. The the crystal, the the cards, the whatever, it's a symbol, but the power comes from somewhere else. And idolatry is when you forget. It's fun to play with crystals. It's fun to play with cards. It's so much fun to have little figurines. I have tons of them, but it's not the true source. Idolatry means forgetting that fact. There is an almost invisible, t inevitable, I'm oh, sorry, this 
falling into forgetting where the source is, is an almost inevitable temptation for all of us, living as we do in a world where the material plane is deemed the only true reality. So we're told that this out here is real and whatever you're imagining is just uh, imagining. It's not real. And it's actually the opposite. It's flip-flopped of that. The mistaken thought that the material world is our salvation is the insanity at the heart of all error. You guys, I have to turn the car on because it's getting cold. So uh, you're going to hear like beeping and starting car noises. Oh, no beep. It's cold. I had to turn the heater on. Get some heat going here because I'm, I'm getting cold. Okay. The mistaken thought the material world is our salvation. You can't find salvation in anything or anyone. We don't own each other. A lot of things we do is because we're scared we're going to lose a thing or a someone. We don't own things or someones. We only own our own body and what's inside of it. Um, so changing your behavior because you're afraid of how another person's going to respond, that is lunacy. That's insanity. She says it's the insanity at the heart of all error. I totally 100% agree with that. In our work lives, this delusion leads to various errors. Fear masquerades as humility. Irresponsible behavior masquerades as reasonable risk. Overspending masquerades as an attitude of abundance. Unethical advertising masquerades as no big deal. Financial shenanigans masquerade as merely how things are done. Um, you may have had the experience of working for a company who's like, well, you know, whatever, we have enough attorneys and we have enough money. If somebody so sues us, we still come out ahead as a way to justify unethical behavior. That's crap. Uh, and that eventually comes back on people. If we do it for someone else, it will not last. We can only do it for ourselves. One of the things that my husband says frequently is, and it bothers me a lot, and I, he knows this, it's no secret, that without our relationship he will fall apart I don't want that responsibility and you can't give that responsibility to someone else if you fall apart that's on you if I fall apart that's on me and to hand someone that power we go round and round when this topic comes up because he doesn't do this study so he doesn't see what I'm talking about isn't that what we're raised with though we're raised with that you're my everything. You complete me. Yeah, they don't care because he'll save them. That's a lot of responsibility to give someone. People will say, I'm staying sober for my kids. You can't stay sober for your kids. Love of children is not enough to stop addiction. You've seen it happen a zillion times. Love of family is not enough to stop addictions. You thought it was a guy thing. <laughs> Maybe. I think we do it too. We're raised with this idea that we're defective without that other person. And that if we lose that other person or if we lose our dream job, that's it. We're dead. It's all over. We're useless. We're worthless. Guys, stop telling that story. Just stop it. It never lasts. It can't. You can't build a house on shifting sand and expect it's going to last. Yes, and you've made yourself feel guilt because of being responsible for how the other person feels. You can't do that. You can't. Not if you want to stay on this path. Oh, you can. But it won't. It's not effective with where you say you want to go by being here. Okay, so the antidote to all that garbage is your connection to spirit. But, yeah, that's a lot of power. 
Our connection to spirit is the antidote to all that crazy pants story stuff. It gives us a sense of wisdom, scale, and righteousness. It gives us confidence and power. It, gives, it is the prayer that our work be used by love to make the world a better place. Bob Dylan captured this truth in his song, Gotta Serve Somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. So pick. Do you want to serve the story or do you want to serve the truth? Do you want to serve fear or do you want to serve love? It is completely your choice. You pick. You get to pick. That's the freedom we have. We get to pick in every moment. Am I serving fear today or am I serving love today? And who would I rather serve? Ah, oh, Susan's so intense. Yes, it's very intense. And it's hard work in the beginning. It's like walking through quicksand. But it gets easier. It really does get easier. I can, I promise you it gets easier. But man, it takes some serious dedication and some serious grit to keep going in the beginning of turning this stuff around. It's so hard in the beginning. It's so hard. Yeah, in the beginning. It's difficult. And then it gets easier. Like any other skill, when you're first learning how to draw, it's hard. When you're first learning how to drive, it's hard. But you stay focused on where you want to end up, and you'll get there, and it gets easier. Okay, pray to serve the universe, and the universe will serve you. That which is proactively placed, proactively, meaning we're consciously choosing, to place ourselves in the service of love is protected from the grip of fear. When you stay connected to love and you understand that regardless of what's happening, everything's going to be okay. Even if it's painful right now, even if you're crying right now, everything is at the root of it all okay. You're protected from that grip of fear. You're protected from uh, what she calls the uh, forces of destruction. That which is proactively placed in the service of good and holy and beautiful is protected from the forces of destruction. Take yourself, your work, and the God within you seriously. Dedicate yourself daily, hourly, even moment by moment. Sometimes it's moment by moment, right? Sometimes it's like, don't eat that brownie for five minutes, okay? Can you wait five minutes? <laughs> Can you sit with the anxiety of knowing there's a brownie in the kitchen and not eat it? There's no brownies in my kitchen because I'd be eating them. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Can you wait five minutes before sending that email? Gotta eat it. If there's a brownie on my counter, it ain't gonna be there for long. Only sometimes. Yeah. There's sometimes I have to talk myself down off the ledge because my husband has lots of junk food in the house. Um... Sometimes I make it, sometimes I don't. <sighs> okay. Take yourself. Please make your heart a priority. If you made your own happiness your first priority for today, can we do that? Can we make our own happiness our own priority? And when someone crosses our path and we feel an impulse to either withdraw or go toward. Can we just follow it and see where it goes without so much pressure? Should I? Shouldn't I? Is this right? Is this wrong? What do I do? What do I do? Stop asking what do I do and start asking how do I want to feel? How do I want to feel? Not what do I do? Because if you connect to how you want to feel, oh, you'll know what to do. Take a deep breath. If you do this, feelings, not talking, emotion, feelings, yes, it's good to be aware. <clears throat> Take yourself, your work, and the love within you seriously and dedicate yourself to it. 
moment by moment and the ego doesn't stand a chance and you don't have to this is what kills me every time I see another meme or another article or another sentence that says you've got to get rid of the ego you've got to crush it you've got to evict that negative voice in your head well you can't shift to love if you're focused on love you don't need to worry about what your yeah 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 chihuahua brain is saying it doesn't matter it's just barking in the corner and you don't worry about it here's the prayer for today okay dear god i dedicate to you my talents and abilities may they be used in a way that serves love's purposes i'm changing some of the words i'll let you screenshot it I surrender to you my business and finances and relationships and cats and children. May my work be lifted to its highest possibility as a blessing on all the world. Amen. I surrender my fill in the blank. I surrender to you my whatever's bothering you today. I surrender you to you my desire to destroy the good in my life. I surrender that to you. I surrender to you my anxiety that makes me self-sabotage moment by moment. Here's the prayer. Can you see? Can you see? I surrender. If you like gospel music, that that um, that song "I Surrender All" by Amy Grant, go YouTube that. That's a great song. <clears throat> I surrender all. I can't remember the tune, or I'd sing it to you, but I don't. I don't know it. I dedicate to you my talents and abilities. May they be used in a way that serves your higher purposes. You journaled the gremlin thoughts, and by the end, you were focused on love every time. It is a pretty song. Amy Grant, I Surrender All, YouTube. That's great, Susan. That's how it always happens. You start out dumping your negativity on paper. At some point, your body takes a deep breath, and you start to remember the positive. You can't jump over journaling that gremlin voice though you can't skip that part or that suppression yeah it's suppressing otherwise and that negativity will swing out and slap you in the face when you least expect it what you did was perfect journal out that negativity get it all down on paper your body naturally breathes naturally comes back to center it doesn't take a lot of work it's really very easy. I dedicate to you my talents and abilities. May they be used in a way that serves your purposes. I surrender to you my whatever. May my work be lifted to its highest possibility. May my life be lifted to its highest possibility as a blessing on all the world. Amen. Whew, take another deep breath. Ooh, I got goosebumps. I got me some goosebumps on that one. That was wrapping up chapter nine in this book. I got some serious goosebumps. It was. Right? Thank you. It was awesome. Today is awesome. I got chills. I got chill bumps. Powerful things are happening in our lives, aren't they? Every day every day even when it looks like it's not the darkest before the dawn thing even when it looks like everything's going to hell in a handbasket it's not not if you're doing this work any questions nice and toasty in here I probably shouldn't like kick back and take a nap at Heath's place of employment, but now I'm sleepy. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll be around tomorrow with the Twinkie Dinkies. Oh, yeah. I wouldn't miss this. I really don't like when I have to miss my scope. I'm, I'm addicted to my daily scope. 
I probably will fall asleep. No, he hasn't formally quit. He's hedging his bets. He wants to work a... <laughs> I do have some sunglasses. <laughs> I'll put my sunglasses on and just kick back. Um, he is... Uh, his anxiety is asking of him that he work a couple of shifts here before giving formal notice to the other place. But he's laid off, so it doesn't... I mean, what difference does it make? He's got to call him and let him know eventually, but he's not working there anyway, so... Oh, whatever. That's his deal. And I have plenty of other stuff that I can wrestle with besides trying to wrestle with that crazy thought pattern. His anxiety is, yeah, that's his anxiety talking. I know, right? Who's going to come back after that long? Yeah, he wants, he wants to nail this one down first, which is crazy. Whatever. Either way, I mean, even if nothing worked out, he'd start drawing unemployment from Colorado next week. So, whatever. Yeah, it's like uh, keeping an ace in your pocket, right? You don't want to cut it off before you make sure that this one's good. People have to work. That's your anxiety, right? One in the... Uh, my friend Bev used to say... Bev, if you're watching, I hope this is okay that I repeat this. But she used to say when she was young, she wanted a boyfriend and a backup. In case the current boyfriend didn't work out, she always had a backup. <laughs> a boyfriend and a backup. Bev is so cool. I like her too. A <laughs> backup husband. Well, you know what it did though? It kept her getting from too, too fixated on one person. Because she typically had somebody else <laughs> waiting in the wings. I don't think you do. And no, actually, I'm sure she was quite honest with everybody. Because that's just who she is. She, The backup would have known he was the backup. Right. Right, Nina? I could never handle that. You don't. Everyone's like, you don't. You don't tell the backup he's the backup. Oh, <laughs> Susan. Susan dreamed about her backup last night. <laughs> oh, hilarious. Okay. Well, I'm going to go uh, answer some emails and probably fall asleep. And I'm going to make Heath drive home because... There's no ice on the road, so. Uh, Bev is one of those women that could get men to agree to being backups. I was never one of those women. I could usually not even get one to be the front, in the front. <laughs> Much less one in the back. Yeah, she, because she didn't care. She didn't pin her everything onto men folk. She didn't pin her well-being on them. Right. She always keep them guessing. <laughs> yeah, I've learned a lot from, from Bev. A lot. <laughs> okay, well, have a wonderful day. Write it down somewhere that if you keep focused on love, the other stuff will work itself out. You don't need to worry about it. Just let go of that uncontrollable area, areas of your life. I love you very much. So, so, so much. So, so much. And um, I'll see you tomorrow with the twins in the background. Yay! Have a wonderful day. Awesome day. And if you're holding your breath, exhale. Exhale. You don't need to hold your breath. Bye. Love you too.